I was having so many troubles with manufacturing because the coffee was really stable and condensed milk was really stable, but if you put them together, it was like this huge mess and I really wanted a clean product. And so when I was traveling to Vietnam, I saw this format on the desk of our supplier and they were using it for a Japan client because it's a, it's a really popular format in Japan. And so I was like, that would solve so many of my problems. I could create a separate creamer packet. This would be such a, a wonderful expression of Vietnamese coffee that doesn't exist today. It was a backup idea that I was like, I'll just use that for e-commerce, but the core line will still be the ready to drink. But the ready to drink test run completely failed the week before fancy food. So I was like, I guess this is going to be what we have at the booth instead. This is Start Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. In case you weren't aware, National Coffee Day is coming up on October 1st. And what better way to celebrate than with a conversation about the roasted beverage that jumpstarts America every morning. Today's guest is Debbie Way Mullen, founder of Copper Cow Coffee. The first phase of Debbie's path took her all over the world, working for the World Bank. But even though she enjoyed the work, she knew she was destined to set out on her own. Her first venture wasn't the runaway success story she had hoped it would be, so she pivoted. And then she had to pivot again when her next idea missed the mark as well. The product we know as Copper Cow Coffee was only ever intended to be a backup plan, but the success it's had only serves to reinforce the phrase, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Debbie's story is a masterclass in how flexibility and paying attention to market signals can lead to huge returns. So listen in as we cover everything from why her family's experience in the food industry made her avoid it at all costs, why her deal with Robert Herjavec fell through, and how she hired someone from Craigslist to design a logo and accidentally came away with a name for her company. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Debbie, the founder of Copper Cow Coffee. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining. Me. Yeah. Please tell everyone a little bit about what Copper Cow Coffee is. Well, Copper Cow Coffee is the first premium Vietnamese coffee company in the U.S. So we source from sustainable farms and create our signature pour over kits. So it has everything you need with these individual single serve pour overs that are pre-filled with with coffee. And then you can make a pour over anywhere with no equipment. And then we also make our single serve sweet and condensed milk creamers, which are very tasty and a wonderful addition to the experience. What made you want to first start the company? Were you just obsessed with coffee? Were you in Vietnam? What was the thing where you were like, this has to become something that we can market here in in the United States? Um, It's interesting because like to get to this company it was probably a bit of a progression of things i'd say that that my whole life being vietnamese american i've just i always thought that there was some really exciting opportunity in a business sense to be able to kind of mainstream the flavors that i grew up with as soon as i began to realize that people were unfamiliar with them but it's it's also i I grew up kind of conflicted because my mom came here as a refugee and a lot of her brothers and sisters did go into the food business you know my uncle had a hot dog stand and other uncle had a, a restaurant and just saw how hard it was and i think that there was always this like sentiment of like getting into food is just the hardest life and so i never really thought of it as a real option when i was younger And instead, you know, also just having this motivation of one thing I've always known about my career since I was 16, when the first time I went to Vietnam was that I wanted to do something around creating opportunities there in that country um, that were more equitable. And so just seeing that my mom always talked about how hard it was growing up there and how much she didn't have opportunities. And not until I went, did I really see kind of like the extent of it. So I I thought that, you know, becoming an economist and and working for places like the World Bank would be the way that I could do that. And is that what you did? You worked for the World Bank? I did. Yeah. So I I, I went to Berkeley and MIT and studied all the right things and got my cousin works for the World Bank. She was stationed in Congo. Oh, really? They get paid tax free, believe it or not. You do. I do not. It it, it really helped fund the start of Copper Cow Coffee. Actually, yeah, Yeah, it's a big savings. Yeah. How old were you the first time you went to Vietnam? I was 16. Okay. And it's been crazy to see the progression of the country, actually. And so I think that that there's also this like opportunity with coffee that kind of came about because of that. So, you know, Vietnam's actually the second largest coffee producer in the world. Behind um, who? Behind Colombia. Okay. And so it was just really interesting to learn that because I always knew that Vietnam had this like very robust coffee culture. Um, Vietnamese coffee was something that I'd always order at a restaurant. And I would say things like, 
as I came of age in the Bay Area with like Blue Bottle and Phil's and all these things, you know, mm-hmm. coming about, I was like, I wish that there was a version of this of Vietnamese coffee. You did know? you grow up there in the Bay Area? I did. Okay, mm-hmm. right on. That's and amazing. So, so I've yeah. been to Vietnam uh-huh. and I used to live in San Francisco. Oh, nice. So the story's just getting better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was in Vietnam, it was probably uh, three years ago. And yeah, it was amazing. I mean, there was a real coffee culture. Obviously, we were like right in the heart of it all downtown. But it was like, there was a lot going on. There was amazing cocktail bars. I was like super surprised. And the food was amazing. Like I'd go to these restaurants and I wouldn't know how to read anything on the menu. But we just ordered stuff. And yeah. it was like the best food ever. I mean, super healthy also. And just yeah, like the really flavors, fresh. super yeah. fresh. Yeah, it was amazing. And that's what's been really interesting to see in the last 10 years is that is Vietnam emerge as a middle income country. You know, when I remember when I started to really think about this business idea, um, I went to Vietnam and told my mom, you know, that there were cars and she she literally didn't believe me. She's like, wow. it's just it was just bicycles when I went when I was 16. It was like, you'd see, yeah, it was yeah. just like you'd see a taxi once in a while. I mean, mopeds were even like pretty infrequent. And I was telling her, I was like, there are stoplights there. Are cr-. She was like, no, I don't believe you. She literally was like, you're like, you're making things up. And so it was, it's been really incredible to even go back with my mom and have her see how it's changed so much, you know? Um, and so with that rise of a middle income country is a rise of a middle class of disposable income. And when you have a coffee culture, now Vietnamese people are like, well, where does my coffee come from? Like, what does this taste like? How is it brewed? You know, and I think that there's just this great emergence of a supply of premium beans that like was just kind of beginning to come to fruition domestically. And so the timing really worked out well for me to be like, okay, well, this would be a great time to introduce that and connect that to the world's largest specialty coffee market. Which did is you have to find a farm or did you like, what, what was like the first step in, I guess, approaching someone to probably partnering with, with a farmer, I would imagine, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, so what I basically did was I just reached out to anybody that I knew from my previous work, you know, does anybody know anybody who works in coffee? You know, and I talked to people who like, you know, had a restaurant that had a nice coffee menu. I talked to literally and asked them, you know, where do you get your coffee? Like, how does that work? And cause you know, I hadn't really worked in like the food and beverage space before this was all totally new to me. And so it was just like a rabbit hole of hundreds of conversations, honestly, that ended up, I probably sampled about like 40 different farms before I was able to finally work with actually the, the, the co-op that we still work with today that have grown. Um, cause they kind of were doing this, wanting to do the same thing with their supply that we wanted to do, but domestically in Vietnam. So we're kind of their, their U S partner, which has been incredible. So what was the one thing that stood out from them? Like just the, the shared vision for what like you said they wanted to do the same thing in vietnam what you wanted to do in the states was that like what set that farm apart from the other 40 that you visited it was it was this like insane commitment to actually talking about how the coffee was made i felt like there was everybody else it's it felt more co- commodity driven being like oh well what whatever taste you want we can make you know it, it felt a little bit it just didn't it didn't seem like None of the coffee would be as premium as I wanted it to be, which means it has to score an 80 or above. And basically... On what score? There's like this coffee kind of grade scale from zero to 100. Okay. Um, and so to be 80 or above means that there's there's a, there's a requisite amount of like smoothness and flavor notes that you're going to get. And there's like a group of people that like panelists or somebody? It is so insane. Like I still struggle to really be able to, to totally grade it blindly. But if you get people who are professional like roasters and tasters, yeah. they can be blindfolded in separate rooms and they will all be within a few points of each other. It is actually That's incredible. Kind of cool. That makes sense. I mean, it's like that with wine. Yeah, it's it's so, it's so similar to wine. I, I think, tell people yeah. all the time, like it sounds snobby, but if you grew up drinking Coke and I gave you a Pepsi, you would like be like, what is this? This is garbage. Exactly. And it's just like, that's how that's how quickly your taste buds can can change and yeah. you can pick up on things pretty. So like, the, yeah, I get it. That makes sense. The more you know about coffee, the less you know. That's like definitely <laughs> the way yeah, it's felt. It's philosophical. For the, the guys yeah. in the front do that. They do blind. So Farm Cup in the front, they'll do yeah. the blind tastings every, I want to say every month. They're part of like some monthly group Nice. And so they get a bag. It has no name on it. And then they taste it. They guess where it's from. They describe it. And then they get their answers like the following week. Yeah. You'd be surprised at how people can be very, very spot on with it. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. So you mentioned that, you know, you partially funded Copper Cow through working at the World Bank and not having any taxable income. <laughs> uh, it's a perk. It is, it a, is a perk of perk. the World yeah, Bank. Yeah, what yeah. I wanted to ask is, was it, you know, as simple as you were working at World Bank one day, 
quit your job, went full time into Copper Cow, or was there some overlap there in between where, you know, you were still having your day job and yeah. then kind of building up Copper Cow on the side? Very good question. Um, definitely in parallel for a while. Mm-hmm. So um, not a lot of work-life balance, I guess <laughs> you could say for a while. Because um, I actually started off first with a cooking line because I was really obsessed with like mainstreaming Vietnamese flavors. And it was something that was a good experience for me to kind of do part-time on the side. I was renting commercial kitchen space, you know, in the evenings and weekends, literally selling it door to door to like different retailers. I think within within about a year, I got into a lot of retailers, like, and this was about eight years ago. And so I'm still full-time at the World Bank. I learned about like, how are you allowed to make something and actually legally sell it? Like, what do stores expect it to, to pay? What do, How are they going to mark it up? So how do you get the product to stores? Like, all these things were, it was a great learning experience for me to have while I was still full-time at the World Bank. And I think that I did have this idea of like, okay, every month I'm going to sell more until one day it's in every home of America. Like, I think I was very naive about the amount of capital that that you, it would require. And so I think that's what it started off as I, I kind of had this like sa- these savings from my, my previous career that was theoretically supposed to go to maybe like a down payment for a house. And so you're like, okay, let me put like $10,000 into this and just see what happens, you know? And then you're like, okay, let me put another $15,000 in until you're like, okay, now I'm beginning to see <laughs> that curve of going into profitability where you're you know, your profits exceed your overhead is just a lot longer than I thought it was. And that's when I started to look into both raising capital and also thinking about about actually quitting my job. And that's actually when I decided to move into the coffee space. That's when I kind of realized that the cooking line showed a lot of promise in terms of people enjoying the brand and the premise and that I understood like the unit economics I needed for it to work, but I needed a bigger market. And that was when I kind of began to explore the Vietnamese coffee industry and just got, I just got so excited. And and I was always really into coffee and my my father drank pour over literally every day of my whole life growing up. So when it started to get big, it was a very exciting thing to think about, you know, making it easier for people. What was the food line? What was it? Was it like prepackaged food? Like what was the concept? Oh my God. It was so, it was so esoteric. It was like meant, meant for like me, essentially. That's okay. when you, that's what, another lesson about starting a company is like, don't make, <laughs> don't make the product for yourself. Make it for a bigger market. market it was, yeah. um, the, so in my family, we bottle things all the time and it, just to make things a little bit easier and give them to each other. And, and so there is this type of oil that we used to, that we cook with from the French influence, you deep fry f- shallots in oil. And then the oil afterwards just makes everything taste amazing. So it was infused oils and vinegars so that you could replace your oils and vinegars at home and everything would taste kind of like that fresh Vietnamese um, Got it. taste. What were you working at the World Bank? So I worked on loans to governments that would be focused on supply chain projects, mostly on transit development, so that that we're all focused on alleviating poverty. So mostly connecting, you know, rural areas or, you know, economic zones so that people would have more opportunities. Where were you stationed? I was in D.C. and at one point I was in Bangkok and then I was also, but I spent a lot of time in Delhi as well. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that. A All different right. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my cousin, she uh, was in Canada for a little while and then Congo, yeah. Germany for a bit. Seems like a great organization to work for if you want to see the world. It's or that. Be It's also like really yeah. amazing work, you know? They do a lot of very like honorable work, I, I would imagine. Yeah. It's or how, a, that's how I describe it's an, it. It's an impossible job though you know it's yeah, really yeah. hard it's You're really connected hard to the real problems of the world yeah. yeah and and it's hard to have accountability and there's a lot of things that are hard about it and for me it just it was a really hard match culturally like these big bureaucratic places i think that i know people who i got to work had the privilege of working with who are brilliant and they they can thrive and really move boulders but for me i was like i want to move faster i felt like it was incredibly ageist, honestly. It was a really hard thing, was being like in my 20s and working there. You know, people were like telling me to take notes. And I'm like, I have the same level as all these other people, but just because of the way I looked, people would just have a lot of, they're pretty, it's just an, an old organization, you know? It was pretty hard for me. That's what drives you a lot of, uh, to entrepreneurship in general. Yeah. Is that, that type of, they're like, oh, wow, I can't grow at the pace I want. So I need to leave this thing, which makes sense. We're all, We'll all survive and thrive in our own climates, and so we just have to find them. Let's go back to the coffee thing. So at this point, you you pivoted from food to coffee, yes. and and at that moment, you had already left, or you were leaving 
your position at the World Bank? So as soon as I fundraised friends and family money, How I was How much like, did you raise? I raised 400000 Okay, and that friends, was when, family, yeah. to and, do just coffee. And some and a couple angels, yeah. Okay. Um, basically, I like hit up anybody that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> like I was getting like $10,000 checks from coworkers that I was like, hey, I'm going to do this. They were like, sure. It was really awesome, the the kind of support. And, and it, I think it, it was such a great entrepreneur experience of just like, you just got to ask and you're going to be surprised by who says yes and who says no. You know, I think it was a really totally true. good experience. Okay. So then you raised and then what'd you do? And then I quit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then finally was able to like a hundred percent dive in and it was really exciting. We launched a few months later at the fancy food show. So I was able, it was, it was interesting though. Cause when I fundraised, I was actually trying to make a ready to drink version okay. of the product. Um, what, year, what year was this? This was 2016. Okay. So at that time, I mean, that's, that's not a bad idea. I mean, at the time it's like the hottest area, right? You know, um, but one thing that was so great about having that oil and vinegar line was I knew how hard it was to ship a heavy liquid product. And it was, even though it was a small market, at least I had a good margin because like people are willing to pay quite a bit for a bottle of oil or vinegar. Yeah. But I was like, so if I want it to be a $3. Yeah. There's your shipping. Drink. I was like, how do you, it's gone. how do you actually, don't you just lose money every time you sell it until you sell your like, you know, at like 20 million in revenue maybe. And, you know, I was a first time entrepreneur. I think the, the, the idea of raising that kind of money was pretty daunting. And I was having so many troubles with um, manufacturing because the coffee was really stable and condensed milk is really stable. But if you put them together, it was like this huge mess and I really wanted a clean product. And so when I was traveling to Vietnam and could, like concurrently trying to source, like finding this source of coffee, having these hundreds of conversations with um, people to find the right beans, I saw this format on the desk of our supplier and they were using it for a Japan client because it's, it's a really popular format in Japan. And so I was like, that would solve so many of my problems. I could create a separate creamer packet. This would be such a, f- a wonderful expression of Vietnamese coffee that doesn't exist today. It was a backup idea that I was like, I'll just use that for e-commerce, but the core line will still be the ready to drink. But the ready to drink um, test run completely failed the week before fancy food. So I was like, I guess this is going to be what we have at the booth instead. I love yeah. the story. <laughs> yeah, I love I mean, because that's the reality of how yeah, it goes. Yeah, it is. Um, I remember Starbucks was launching their, so instant coffee in general has a really bad, like people think it's cheap. Yeah. So if you go to Starbucks or if you go to here, as an example, instant coffee is like, ah, you're, it's yeah. below you. Yeah. And so when Starbucks was rebranding, they were trying to figure out a way, what's the right marketing message to make their instant coffee? And so they realized that they had so much cachet with the Starbucks name that they would just put Starbucks in front of it. And so it became like Starbucks to go. And it was just the packets. Yeah. And uh, that's how they solved the marketing problem. They sold it for like three bucks, I think. But it's something everyone struggles with. The instant coffee is for some reason just not... People don't like it. Yeah. And they don't want to spend that much money on well, it when they it buy it. conjures up images of like fast food. You know, if you I are given so, yeah. a McDonald's burger versus something that you would get at a, you know, fine restaurant, it's easy to see where that comparison can get messed up in people's minds. Yeah. So then how'd the show go? The show is great. We got <laughs> chosen as the innovation of the show. Um, wow. So we were one of the top five. They, so they, cho- they choose five innovations of like the 1500 products there. And, and so. why why was it? It was because they, it was like a package they'd never seen before. It was a pour over that you did at home. Yeah, they were just like, this is so different and innovative. And the quality is so great because of this format. The fact that you can like have everything ready and it still tastes like you know a, a barista made it for you i feel like we should do it now yeah yeah <laughs> it's yeah. now a good time yeah, to yeah. yeah. let's it. do it and while we're doing this i'm gonna make you multitask <laughs> can you just explain so i'm unfamiliar with fancy foods uh is oh, yeah, it yeah 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 in general or in general like any fancy food oh no, no there, like <laughs> <laughs> there is a one of the biggest trade shows that they have um, in the food and beverage world for people who are trying to get into grocery stores is called the fancy food show so it's where you go and have like premiums it's a rotating trade show going to multi they have one on the east coast and, okay. one on the west coast every year and so it's a place where you get to meet you know thousands of buyers um so it's it's where we got into our first um you know thousand doors god that's that's such a great little shortcut like rather than you know going to a thousand different stores individually yeah yeah and i think it's so interesting now because i'm when i talk to people who are starting companies um i tell them a lot about that's how we started but i think i wonder how what they're going to be like from now on because 
buyers in the interim have had to find other ways to do it. So are they going to still go and rely on them? Because even with just the, the prevalence of like the internet beginning to be incorporated into your food and beverage buying, like I've seen like less and less business like coming to the shows, you know, relative to like 2016 to yeah. 2017, right? As you're pouring this, do you give people directions on the pour also? Oh, I should. Um, so with a pour over, you kind of want to wet the ground. So you saw I put just a little bit in there yeah. so that it got a little bit wet so that it does a nice bloom. You'll notice that like everything kind of puffs up and that's how you're going to get, if you just wait 20 seconds before starting to fill it up, you're going to get a much fuller expression. But if you don't do that, which like a lot of our customers don't, it still tastes good. <laughs> but since I'm making it for you, I'm going to make it this right. This is so cool. If you want to drink it like Vietnamese style, I would have just I would do like one two pours so it's like you get this Super like crazy shot yeah and if mm. you want it, it even tastes kind of more like an espresso if you just wanted to add like the rest with milk but you know the typical customer will like you know fill it up until the top and then add the sweet and condensed milk because Americans love like a 12 ounce like 16 sure. ounce like sip on all day yeah. kind of hot coffee yeah and that's it that goes in the trash yep, it looks like it's all trash. paper totally sustainable well, so we're working on a fully compostable version of it right now. So okay. right now um, it does have to go in the trash, but from then, a business perspective, yeah. why are you doing that? Is that important to you or is that something that you it's just, a, it's incredibly important to us. You know, okay. um, that's something that, that is like top of mind that the whole team is. It's incredibly important to you. And where's the hang up on creating a 100% disposable or compostable package? Like what part of it? are you having trouble with? Um, so the problem really comes with like the seams of, you can tell that some things are like kind of almost like in a way like glued together or um, adhe adhered and having that be compostable is pretty challenging. Um, and what's hard is that for the past like three years, our supplier has been saying like, since we started the company being like, oh, we're months away from having a compostable version of this. And so we've always assumed, like kind of t took it for granted, um, it actually coming to market. So we're looking into other avenues that we can self fund that innovation as well, because um, we, we, we they did finally come, COVID was a huge hang up for delaying it, but they came, gave us the, the prototype and it, it just, it kept falling apart on our big American mugs. And, you know, obviously that's not something that we can have. So now we're just trying to f come out with our own version of that. And so that's something that we're pretty focused on right now. Yeah. I would imagine it could be like some origami. Like there's like a, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like that's the thing like... is that we're finally just like, we just got to think yeah. of like bring in some industrial designers and this, you know, figure out how to do this. Cause I think what's there's, interesting you is. You could definitely do that. So when I was at yeah. MIT one time and there was a talk on origami and its implications around like crystals. Yeah. And how uh, basically it solves like very high level math problems at some point. And they were basically saying like, oh, look, you can use origami or at least the, the philosophy of it for woodworking, for housing. Yeah. And it's all like nothing. There's no glue. Yeah. You know, it's just like complex crystal structures, essentially. Yeah. That's the thing is you look at a tea bag that are compostable and you're like, so why can't this be, you know? And so I think that we, we know that there's something, I mean, it was what, what the reason why we signed up, I signed up with this was because they said that it was in the product roadmap, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's, it's, you, it's hard. I know Brooke's really dealing hard. with this too, because yeah. yeah, the milk comes frozen. And so it's like, how do you make that compostable? The whole thing. Yeah. And so it's exactly. super challenging. And yeah. ultimately expensive for the first iterations. Exactly. So that's exactly. So who's gonna who's gonna do the investment for the for the category? Because you know, I think what's interesting is is the even the decision about do you patent it? You know, because if like I think you should. <laughs> you should, but you also want to make it affordable so that right. like other people aren't just creating more trash and contributing to the space. So I think it's it's you go back and forth about kind of what the mission is and why people work for you. You yeah. know, when you first came out, how much was it? Is it the same price now? Was it, um, has your price changed? It's actually always been the same price. Um, okay. We just like barely had any margin in the beginning, you know, cause you're just like making like a thousand units at sure, a time sure. and stuff, you know. So how much is it for a pack of how many, six? So this one is a five pack. This is what you'll find in Whole Foods. Okay. So you've got a five pack of coffee if I, that comes also with five creamers. Oh, nice. Um, and so that is $10. That's super cheap. That's good to hear. <laughs> Are you going to raise your prices? <laughs> I mean, Are we're, you considering we're, we're it? well, so it's, it's, it's been $15 to start. And then it's just that grocery stores take a smaller margin, you know, um, and we're going national with whole foods next month. And so we are able to like get a good deal with a better, better markup. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. We're very excited. Yeah. Where did your first round of capital take you? Like how far did it take you? Oh man. A day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's how it I think it this feels. is the thing. I mean, it goes quick. People don't realize that. Uh, yeah. and you're also subject to the market on a lot of things packaging 
iterations of that, marketing, iterations of that. It goes very quickly. Yeah, and I think that the the thing that is exciting and hard is that like with these companies, because you it's just impossible for you to be profitable in the first year. So then if things go better than you planned, it just means that you're running out of money faster. Um, so so I did have to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you're just fact. like, you know how I said yeah. I needed like money for, for 18 months? It's actually only lasting me nine months, you know? And so I did go back to the well and just raise from the exact same angels because everything happens so fast within the first year. And so um, we ended up, so it ended up being about 900,000 from all of them. Um, for, in that and did you set a valuation? So this is the question we get a lot oh from gosh. entrepreneurs that are just yeah. starting all the time. And the question is like, how do I value my company? And I tell them like, look, it's an art and a science. Yes. At the end of the day, you have to know your market. Like if you're tech, then you have to go for probably a higher valuation than like, let's say a clothing company. Yeah. Right. But when I say the people that don't, like, don't believe me, like, oh, I think it's worth 10 million. And I'm yeah. like, you don't have any revenue. Yeah. How can it be possibly worth 10 million? You have nothing. Yeah. But and if people think I'm being like a bad guy. I'm like, no, totally. like this is the, this is a real thing. Like what? And so it's always like a what did you what did you end up? Oh my gosh! Like, was I, it like I, a sales projection? And you were like, I'm yeah. gonna make it that. Yeah. yeah. So I had a sales projection, and then I like trip, and then I tripled it. I remember yeah, that perfect. was like that was like the thing it's that literally I did. the best thing to do. Oh, but, but at the same time, like <laughs> actually, it was like probably too low because we ended up making we ended up making way more. We ended up making yeah. way more than because I think I was like. There's also like an art to projections, you know, because you want to show how ambitious you are, but you also want to deliver. And I think that that's something that's really impossible to do in the first few years of a company. Because like if you said you were going to make two million from nothing, but you made one point five, is that like a failure? You know, Cause like like you like aim to do that. I think that there's there is an art to that too that was really hard and for me you know i came from not the startup world and not any so i was just like the most realistic like lowest possible knew that i would make revenue and now i'm like no you should actually do something a little bit more ambitious so probably could have did a disservice to myself but you know but your investors are happy i'm sure <laughs> and they're friends and family so it's yeah. like just super fun honestly it's not like um you know somebody who's like who i'm beholden to that's like that i don't get along with it's people that are just so excited to be on the ride with me you know mm -hmm. that have been so supportive you know it's the same thing i tell people though it's it's the first year revenue times three that's it yeah i'm like that's your number yeah and they're like what if i don't hit it i'm like well what if you exceed it <laughs> well exactly what it yeah i mean and luckily we, we exceed you'll never it. know until you're there so yeah just exactly. set a number and raise some money yeah we'll be back to the episode right after this message this episode is brought to you in partnership with chobani Chobani's mission is making better food for more people, and they brought that mission to non-dairy by crafting the ultimate oat milk for food service, Chobani Oat Barista Edition. It's plant-based, gluten-free, non-GMO, and vegan-friendly. Their formula was crafted for superior performance and versatility. Whether adding to black coffee or creating the perfect microfoam, Chobani Oat Barista Edition will satisfy your cafe needs and delight your customers. Now, back to the episode. And then you were on Shark Tank at some point. We, we were just really recently, just recently actually, yeah. a okay. few months ago. So okay. by the time yeah. you had gotten to Shark Tank, yeah. how much total had you raised? Was it still at the 900000 or had it been? No, no. Okay. We, we had raised a seed round of funding with VCs. So okay. we had raised an additional $2 million at that okay. point. Because mm -hmm. when you went on Shark Tank, I believe you asked... Six hundred thousand for four percent originally. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you ended up getting a deal with Robert mm -hmm. at the end of it, and he cut that evaluation in half. Yeah. And, and went to six hundred for eight percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my research, in what happens, because we we know from having other people on this show from Shark Tank, deals can often completely like fall apart yeah. after the show yeah uh, things can happen where you know both parties are just gonna have to walk away amicably like, yeah. what can you talk about that like where you're at right now because i couldn't find whether the deal had actually closed after the show or right not. right it, the deal did not close because okay. um because we the thing is is that it like you tape and then it's they they want to do their diligence for so long they want it because it's like they want to know whether you're going to air it just ended up not the timing didn't work out because we were ready shortly after that because we just kept growing with well before the airing yeah um, and i would so, imagine with the whole foods deal which you probably knew of when you went on no because the whole foods deal i taped this in august 2020 wow. okay because okay. it, it was almost a year before it aired so wow. so much so much happened so like it, this yeah. is august 2020 that we or it was like Jul end of july it was so late so early and then um the next few months we just grew so much that i was like I'm, i need to go raise around 
and they were not willing to budge and they we hadn't moved at all on the negotiations and i was like i'm not going to like oh, anchor myself to yeah. this valuation when like we were so much larger than it's that. a good story i mean this is um, a reality yeah. here yeah, you this, are having yeah. to raise capital and you have a deal on some different terms than you're yeah. about to raise. And, and, and their typical model is they want to kind of really make sure that you're going to err, I right. think is something that's a huge part of whether they're going to go through with it. And, you know, you don't know until a few weeks before whether your episode airs, you know. So I remember we had just taken it out of the forecast because we had kind of had like a little Shark Tank bump and we were like, because I think it was, there was only a few <laughs> weeks left of the season. So I was like, it's time for us to, they're like, you're going to be on the season finale. So we were like, okay, so we actually will air um, after all. So it's been, that that was that was a wonderful wonderful like nice to have for sure so you did have time then to prepare for the inevitable shark tank bump right yeah after the airing yeah and and what did you see in that was it sizable was it more than you expected less than you expected it was a little more than we expected i think also what was interesting for us is that we sell predominantly on our our own website but i think that what was really interesting to see was that we we saw like a really big bump on amazon because we amazon's like Mm -hmm. typically like 10 percent of our e-commerce revenue and I think it was just, it just shows you that it's like that kind of purchaser who's like literally buying as the segment is running, you yeah. know, is that, that kind of person. And that's like someone who's just going to like sign on to Amazon and, and just like also just maybe signifying like how Amazon is just becoming like a bigger and bigger place. Did you have, did you have given Amazon a tremendous amount of product? As much as they would let us, you know, I think what's really hard is it's, it's always been a challenging, um, I'm sure like a lot of entrepreneurs can relate. It's a really challenging route for us operationally because especially post COVID, there's so many maximums on inventory. And so then if you sell out, you're just again, penalized being like, well, your last, you know, three months of sales weren't great. We're like, well, that's because you didn't give (laughs) us. us So it's a really hard chicken and egg to get that going when, when like, it's not the core business because like we have so many great loyal customers who come to our website that we're, we're we just tend to be more focused on but i think that like that shark tank kind of effect where it's like something where someone's like very impulsively like just like i want to try the thing that i'm that's in front of me right now it's an important opportunity that we're we're always re- every year i feel like we say the same thing we reevaluate amazon we're like well i don't know it's a lot bigger than it was last year oh that's interesting yeah it's a pain to manage though it's a total pain and you just don't, that I mean, Excel like, sheet is so yeah, awful. It's really, it's been, it's a, it's, it's a love hate. <laughs> well, it's good. I'm glad to hear about the bump worked out well. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever sure. meet Robert in person? He's here in LA. Did you guys ever connect? Um, no. Oh my God. All these so people also team. have like armies of people who yeah. deal with these yes. deals. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, I didn't, but I mean, I obviously got to meet him when we taped and I think I was like really surprised by how much it was such a real pitch, even though of course it's like, um, a lot of people kind of yelling at you because they're all celebrities who want sound bites it's not like a more civilized pitch if you're normally pitching to five people but really like dug into everything and they're they're all real deal investors for sure and did you want did you have like a favorite before yeah, you walked in, like you never you know like, who's oh, going to be there. I want Lori. Like, did you? Have I mean, a I, I was. It's interesting too, because like I back channeled a lot of like references for people who had taken deals and stuff, and and you know, I think that like even my experience pitching too, I just I, I can't have as more respect for Lori, um, even and in going into it and also coming out of it. Um, so I think I I did kind of was excited about her, but she was like, "This isn't the kind of coffee I drink." Um, so it was it was kind of sad. What kind of coffee does she drink? She's like, I drink the weakest coffee. She's like, I basically drink like like i use like a teaspoon of coffee to make like 20 ounces of actual oh, wow. liquid coffee and so this is very strong coffee and so it's, she was like it's delicious by the way yeah. thank you thank you yeah, yeah yeah i'm gonna add some of the creamer oh, now yeah please. I can try this but it's interesting that so like you know Lori, Lori backed out, but you were on QVC around the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, it ended you, up airing at like the exact yeah. same time. Yeah. How did that go for you? And um, have you been on since, or was it just like a just that one time? And it's funny because okay. like I always was skeptical about QVC because our customer is like a twenty-five to thirty-five year old woman. Like that is like the person who buys like the majority of our product. And it's just an older demographic that's on QVC or Home Shopping Network. And it's it's just so interesting, like from whether you look at our sales data or from so many times of, of serving coffee to mass audiences, like as you approach 40, like after 40, your, your coffee habits like much more solidify relatively. And they're just people who like, you're going to get people saying like, this could, there's no way this can be better than the French press I've been drinking every day for the past 20 years, you know? Versus like a, a 25 year old is just like so excited by something different. And so I think that that's just something, it wasn't that same effect that we were kind of like hoping for. 
back, right? They're like used to like the consumer there is used to picking up the phone. Yeah, and talking it's a, it's to somebody. A it's not the most internet savvy uh, customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's gonna be rel- a relatively older customer, and so like uh, the companies that I know who have done really well in there definitely serve an older demo. So it, it didn't end up being kind of like the partner that we were looking for. Still a wonderful, very very admirable operation over there. Like was great, a, a great to work with them, but just not didn't reach our target demographic. Social scientists have long said that our tastes solidify yeah. and get harder to change as we get older across yeah, the board. Totally. And, you know, so it's it's interesting that your own data backs that up in a way with, you know, the 25 to 35 year old woman being like the biggest market and demographic for your coffee. I'm curious if there are, in what you've seen, different areas of the country that maybe outperform what you thought or do less than what you thought? That's such a good question because something that's so interesting about specialty coffee is that it's very regional. Like LA, where we got we got like Groundworks, you know, Bay Area, it's Blue Bottle, Chicago, it's Intelligentsia. You know, it's like everybody, like these, these coffee companies just over-index so much because their main mode of discovery or marketing is are cafes. And that's like typically how a roaster is able to really get an audience. And so if they go into CPG, they always over index regionally. And so that's something that's so unique about being like a digitally native coffee company is, and also I think the fact that we do serve the coffee with creamer um, and that it's a sweetened creamer. Cause I think that the, the brand itself, like sometimes people, especially investors wonder if it over indexes on the coasts, which a lot of like high end brands do, but per capita, we're like incredibly incredibly over indexed like Indiana is like an incredible state for us like it's so interesting how well we do and it's also not as totally urban related so again like per capita of course our biggest markets are California Texas and New York but that's just kind of more because there's more people there but I think that people all over the country follow great cafes and lo- and have maybe like one or two really great coffee shops in their town, but they want to try other things. And I think that this is such a great way to be able to experience that in your home, you know. Do you ever think about like a real, a retail strategy? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it would be, it would be so fun. It's such a dream to be able to do that. I think we um, got really close to opening up one in, in L.A., um, like to do a pop-up for about six months and it ended up falling through. And I remember this, this was like the year before the pandemic and I felt like really sad about it, but also felt like it was a huge lesson in understanding that this is such a different business than a CPG business. It's a complete, like, like trying to make my staff who are good at like creating digital ads and, and working with suppliers and doing all these things and working with retailers. It's like a completely different skill set than like hiring 20 people to come in and, you know, build out something. And I think it was just a huge lesson. And I, I, even though I think it all serves the brand in a very elegant way, operationally, it's so different. And so I was like, okay, maybe this is more of a five-year plan that we do something like this. Um, and, and that I think it's, it'll be such a wonderful extension of the brand, but it's a, a real investment for the business, even though one thing that's great about cafes is that they are actually, if you get them to work, incredibly great businesses. Like they're very profitable. They're, you know, it's, yes. it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to get into, but COVID made us feel like we lucked out by that not happening, honestly. Yeah, Um, I think you're right. I think like the way I look at it, there's this like headline now, it's called like clicks and bricks. And so the whole concept of you have your D2C play, right? All online, all digital. Yeah. Those are all your clicks, but there has to be, so less so now, but some sort of like pop-up brick and mortar concept where people can meet you where like you can meet the customer where they are. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting for brands and I think it's so smart. I don't, you know, I think think these pop-up, the pop-up concept is something that you can make amazing. You can invite influencers to, you can invite your loyal fans to, maybe celebrities, investors, whoever might be there. And it's just a way to connect with them in a, in a different way without signing like a five-year lease and then having to figure out how to deal with that operationally. And I think that it would be just the most powerful and exciting vehicle for product innovation and testing, yeah, you know, because um, when the way that we even came out with our first, our because we, we built the company to about a million in revenue with just like the five pack of just classic coffee. There were no flavors. It was just one skew. 
and we were really struggling with like average order value when you only have one product. So we're like, we have to come out with another product for e-commerce to work. And the way that we chose it was that we were having all these pop-ups in, at offices. Cause at the time we were selling a lot into, into offices for them to have like a Vietnamese coffee Friday, like delivery every week. And um, we would, would, we would do these pop-up activations for them. And so we'd have a pour over bar and then we would have these People flavors. Love that. Yeah, exactly. Love that. And it was so fun. Oh yeah. Nuts. We were in San Francisco at the time and it yeah. was like all these, we would just have like some lavender mocha, rose petals, peppermint, and be like, you can just put it into your pour over and then it'll naturally infuse into it. And people were so excited. Mind yeah. Yeah. People were so excited, <laughs> had so much fun, except for the only thing was, is like, as the barista, I was like, you're putting too much in. Don't, it's going to taste bad. <laughs> like, or you're not putting enough in or, yeah. and I think that I was like, we should just manufacture it with the exact amount that there should be. And then I, it got like, it was that from was those pop-ups that we were able to discover that. And you know, now, I mean, let alone retail, even e-commerce, it take like retail, that's like years to be able to get a new product and see if it works. But e-commerce, it's still like, we have to make thousands of it, see if people like it, um, wait for product reviews to come in. And, and not only that, but like you only get to hear from the noisy customers. It's nice to be able to talk with somebody and see what they find exciting about it. And so I, I look forward to being able to have pop-ups yeah. um, someday soon. What brought you down to LA? My sister and my brother-in-law live down here. So my sister moved here um, and they're entrepreneurs and they were the ones who like really pushed me um, into considering doing this. And one of the carrots was, you can just stay with us while you launch it. You know, this is back when I'm like still just like using that World Bay mo Bank yeah. money, you yeah, know? Yeah, and yeah. so I came down here and lived with them for the first year of the business. And, and it's, it's such a great place to launch a company. Oh my gosh, it's like such great talent and you're near manufacturing. I think that there's, um, especially for when you're trying to build a brand. I mean, like right before we were just like, you know, do, working on our brand toolkit. And I'm like, I'm just going to go to like the arts district for a while before I work on this. Cause I just want to like feel inspired before, you know, it's such a great place to be. It's totally brand. true. When you think about building a brand, what are some of the things that you move in the direction of? Like what's the strategy for your brand building? That's a great question. Especially right now, like as your company, you're yeah. kind of at that point where yeah. it, that's kind of the most important piece for you. Now. Totally. I mean, that's, that's the asset you're building at the end of the day, yeah. right? You know, um, when I think about the great coffee companies, it's like a great supply chain and a great brand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. for, for me right now, cause cash is so tight. It's like, I think I built the whole beginning of the brand by just really focusing on like an aesthetic mm -hmm. and a feeling and quality of product and a great customer experience. And that was kind of all we could afford. And then having just raised the series A, I think it's like so exciting. Congratulations. To be able to, thank you. How big was that um, round? Um, 8.5 million. And so I think investing in like below that skin deep, like it's not just like a great tasting, beautiful coffee brand. Like how do we really bubble up like all of the the great things that we do that people don't see day to day, whether that's the way that we work in our like supply chain or the way we treat employees or kind of what we stand for and like this origin of like what makes Vietnamese coffee so great. And I think that there's also like really digging into kind of the lifestyle. And, you know, like I said about like, this is kind of like, it's a sweet coffee typically. And it's something that's kind of like a treat. And so like really building into that experience of it's not maybe it's not your first cup of coffee because like you're just kind of like half awake and you're just like turning on a pot or you're you know opening up a cold brew from the fridge but this is like your coffee break hmm. you know and I think that that's like that's how do we how do we, we kind of build that? that brand and this like reward and this like wonderful kind of experience that is copper cow that's like kind of more than just another can of coffee or another bag of coffee one cool thing i've seen brands do and maybe yours in terms of like sustainability is like you'll just partner with a nonprofit that suits them and then you'll create content around that partnership and so an easy example is like for let's say october is the month of coffee yeah. national coffee days october yeah. 1st and so then for that month all sales percentage of them go to like this sustainable nonprofit. but you're creating content around that whole story Totally. And then you're just pushing it out and then people are supporting something bigger. But now your brand is associated with not sustainability on paper, but like legitimate. Yeah. Here's how much we donated. It's just interesting for me how to see like the lanes brands pick to move in. Yeah. It's one of those decisions that once you make it, you can't undo it. Yeah. And it has replication, you know, it, it carries you, on. You, you're, you're signing up for being held to a higher standard, yeah. you know, and all your decisions yeah. play into that. And I think that's what's 
exciting is that I think like internally we have really stuck to that. Mm -hmm. And then, so how do we make sure that like we now do an outward facing storytelling around that, you know? Why Copper Cow? Yeah, I was going to ask, what's the significance of the name and how you settled on that? First of all, I love it. I love like... (laughs) The logo is amazing. I always judge brands' logos. Thank you. Nick would would tell you if he hated it too. Oh my gosh. Uh, Well, let me tell you about... (laughs) It's. I wish I had a better story, but I was like... Oh no. um, Oh, maybe we should. (laughs) No, no, no. It's it's not a bad story. I think it's it's a nice thing to demystify starting a company maybe. I in general have trouble naming things. It's like one of the things that I think I've never gotten better at after starting the company, but I knew exactly how I wanted the company to look and feel. And I knew that we, one of the big differentiators is that we'd be selling creamer with our coffee and like no other specialty coffee company does that. And so I was like, you know, and I actually always had like this really big inspiration from cowgirl creameries like they had this uh the silhouette of a cow that was like really elegant and i'm like we should have this really modern cow that's made and the company will will have like lots of geometric shapes it'll feel really modern and clean and the cow will be made out of geometric shapes so i hired a craigslist designer for three hundred dollars to make this logo that you see here today that's amazing we have you, not won. Changed it. you won the craigslist <laughs> logo making three hundred i mean like i had to sift through a lot of portfolios to find her she's incredible and then i was like in and i knew that i wanted it to really stand out on a shelf because at the time i'm still thinking like yes we're gonna do e-com but like how do i make it so that someone will walk by and pick it up and i was like i want there to be copper foil on the box and copper will be like the main co- like this is gonna be this copper cow that's just gonna like kind of blindside you on the on the shelf and so i described this to her and she came up with these concepts and just as a placeholder she put copper cow coffee because i was like that was the only like real limitations i was like it's going to be this copper cow logo perfect and then that's a great story accidental (laughs) alliteration (laughs) is phenomenal yeah exactly then i was like i don't know it's like symmetrical i was like (laughs) like like, yeah and so it's a the hard k sound is is always good that's amazing lucked out and haven't had to redo it and now obviously i'm just looking at this you have the creamer coming with it but you could easily partner with other brands to do oat milk or exactly. uh, almond milk exactly yeah we're excited to to look into doing for the vegan community yeah so it's funny i don't know if you knew this or not but in peru this is how they drink coffee also yes yeah. yes in and Latin so America. that's where i'm from and so my, i grew up with my grandfather doing this basically the condensed milk and the coffee and then we yeah. would dip bread in it oh yeah and eat it with bread <laughs> so it sounds very similar yeah we would eat croissants typically like a croissant in vietnam is served with a side of condensed milk and you just like dip it in pretty decadent magical (laughs) yeah yeah when i was in vietnam i would always get almond milk latte and they'd bring me like these little cookies yeah bro (laughs) amazing are you saying we need to start bringing that into the states i'm just saying like maybe they come with cookies i think i think a a partnership would be a wonderful thing to have copper cow coffee copper cow cookie (laughs) copper cow cookware (laughs) Just Go bit, going back to it exactly to go back to it so you just raised some money and so what is on what are the deliverables now like what are the things you're working on now as it relates to growth and so whole foods is awesome that sounds yeah. like obviously that's going to carry super excited about whole foods um they're an incredible partner it's it's funny I, I remember i was talking to the buyer and i told her you know when i was first starting this company my elevator pitch was it's a Vietnamese coffee that would be nice enough to be sold in Whole Foods. And oh, like, wow. Um, it literally was. Yeah. And yeah. so I think it's a pretty great moment. that you manifested like, that. Yeah. And that it's like, <laughs> it's so, like, like I said, coffee's so regional. We're going to be one of, you know, we it looks like six companies that are nationally distributed that are coffee companies in, in Whole Foods. And I think they really recognize the innovation and the the opportunity. I think investing in the brand, like we talked about, like how do we make that really come to life? I think partnerships is a huge part of that. Yeah. Um, but then I think that, Something that we haven't done before is that the website's always been really transactional and we're, we're moving into a space of like, how does the website and the experience of buying online become part of the product? You know, because I think that what's so exciting about this format is we come out with a new flavor every month. You know, what's a way that we can have the people really participate it's much like a more community, closely? Yeah. Community building, maybe texting. Exactly. Maybe you set up a text buying. Yes. I think yeah. that there's like, and just like the way that you can kind can of... see that. The other thing is that with, until literally a week ago you could only buy the coffee with the creamer so now we have it completely modular on the website so that's like, what this is right oh no that's that's the coffee with the creamer okay. and so now we have these, oh, these packs where it's just the coffee and then just the creamer for so the then, people who maybe prefer it with or without the, yeah okay. exactly that's great or, data for you too yeah, yeah I mean, exactly we, that's we, amazing we can't wait to see what people do with their boxes you know? i'll just tell you like if it were me i would just buy 
yeah this. i mean honestly it's like i drink i don't drink this i drink both but i don't drink them in the same proportion right so then like i so i think it's really nice for someone to be able to customize so yeah the fact that like we haven't had that available until now um is something that we're really excited about and in investing in like you know the data analytics to understand what people want i know obviously getting coffee in general is getting more difficult with climate change and all these things so have there been any challenges with your 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 partnership the co-op you're working with so it's interesting about like Vietnam is actually relatively shielded from a lot of the climate change um, issues that today we're facing in, in Africa and South America because it's mostly around water access and Vietnam being tropical. It's just we don't have like the same problems with water access today. So that's not something that's that's a problem today. Other climate change things I'm sure will continue as like temperatures rise and and whatnot for crops. But I think it's just more being like really trying to be like pulling the supply chain to where we want it to be. Cause right now it's like, yes, we have chemical free processing of the beans. We've got, we're paying farmers twice market rates and, and instilling all these like levels of quality that weren't there before. But, but we want to be the first organic certified Vietnamese coffee brand. And that's just going to take some time and effort. And, and, you know, it's, it's the, an education for them understanding like why that there is a customer for that. Cause it's not quite there domestically. There's just a lot of work that is hard to do when a country's on like hardcore lockdown, which is what's happening in Vietnam right sure. now. Tell everyone where they can find you and support yeah. your amazing company that you built. Coppercowcoffee.com. Yeah. Best logo store I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, pretty amazing. Is, and it's amazing. Like, it looks great. I, I just like love that people still call Did you hire her us. full time? Um, so we, we hired her. That's we, a no. no. Did you give her equity? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because she's just somebody who is like... It, she's like a living like designer sure, you know what i mean sure, like, yeah. she like freelance. immediately started it is shortly after her. has been able to kind of have her own freelance and she charges at a couple zeros now yeah, to, to what smart. i did and she's incredibly successful and couldn't like love giving her more work that way that's great so yeah. at, at copper cow coffee mm-hmm. is exactly. the instagram yep look out for national coffee day yeah <laughs> that's exciting stuff yeah thanks for coming on thanks for having me yeah pleasure